It's hard to imagine all that time long, long ago we just met, even before that, when the orientation week for those that made it along. We had some stuff to do and a video to watch and a few things to, to get done before class that here we are about to enter into the final hour of formal AMD classes. So we've made it, we nearly made it. We've still got to get through the next hour and there's still another two weeks. But before we get into finishing things off, we have relevant costs and product planning decisions to have, a, to have a look at. So there are five different scenarios which we'll look at today. And a lot of this deals with some of the stuff from cost, volume, profit from a couple of weeks ago, but it also has this underpinning idea of relevant costs, relevant, relevant revenues, relevant information. So we're going to look at a special order, which we have actually looked at a couple of weeks ago, and most we were pretty much on top of that. Um, what happens if we want to make or buy a component so we could keep things internal within the business and we make it all within the business, um, or we could buy components from outside. So Apple doesn't make its screens internally. Apple makes its screens, no, sorry, it doesn't make its screens. It buys its screens from external and brings them in, probably because it sees that's a better way to do it. Some companies will make things in-house, some won't. We're going to look at some of the numerical work around that, as well as then thinking about what other factors you need to consider. We'll think about a situation where you might want to drop a product line. It looks like a particular product or a division is losing money. And it's like, well, should we get rid of it? Um, what happens if we're dealing with a situation where you can't actually produce unlimited amounts of, amounts of product? You might be making things that require machine hours to make or direct labor hours to make, and you are limited. You don't have unlimited amounts of direct labor or machine hours, so you've got to make decisions about which things to produce. Uh, and lastly, looking at do you sort of value add to a product or you just sell it as is? At the heart of this, and if you've done finance or if you're doing finance, I'd imagine you've come across sunk costs. Is that, okay. So a sunk cost is something anyone want to just very briefly explain? A cost that's, a cost that's oh, that's opportunity cost. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, you can't do anything about it. It has happened in the past. My decision to spend $3 on a coffee it's irrelevant to anything that I do going forward because I have spent that money. It has happened, it's done, I can't go back and change that. So the things that we're interested with in these decisions is what are things that will change in the future? What will change amongst courses of action? Um, so if, let's, if something changes amongst the course of action, that's something we want to include in the analysis. If something doesn't change, it's not relevant to what we're doing. So if we're thinking about a special order um, or a situation where you know, somebody turns up and says, look, you know, we, know you, you know, we know that you normally sell this, for, we normally sell this hotel room for $200 a night, but you, know, you haven't sold it yet. It's due to night. How about I give you $50 for it? Should the hotel do that? Um, so what is appropriate? Do they have capacity? What is it going to cost us? What are the other ramifications of that? If people realize you could start buying things last minute and getting cheap deals, maybe they won't buy early on and just wait to see if there's capacity left and then, um, you know, is that a good thing to do? So the example that we have here, and I need to probably check on this, is whether it's a good idea to use real companies in hypothetical examples, but nonetheless. 150 seats, they've been asked to provide 150 seats to executives attending a conference. Sounds like a junket. Um, corporation offers $125 per ticket. So they're saying, you know, we know that your normal fare is 275. That's what everyone's paying. We don't want to pay that. We want to pay 125. And the bargaining chip would be we've got 150 people coming. Um, so how about it? In terms of capacity, on that particular day, there are five flights, 180 passengers for flight per flight, 900 
seats are available on that route on that day. Normal load on that day is 700, or on a normal day is 700. So they've got 200 spare seats as capacity across that day they do have excess capacity. So they could fit that entire order of 150 without affecting their normal paying passengers. Now, obviously the airline industry is way more complicated than that because not every seat goes for exactly the same price. There's a whole bunch of different variations in there, but for simplicity, let's just go with this. So what are the options? Now, this is a limited set of options. There may be other options in here. Um, Sell the special order tickets at 125, sell them for 275 and tell them, no, we're not doing a special order for you. You're paying full fare for this. Or figure out some other price which works for everyone. So what is it? the first thing to do is to figure out whether or not 125 is actually a good price to do it at. Like, are they going to lose money by selling it at 125? And to look at this, we need to think about what is relevant for these new passengers. So we have five flights, if we're Qantas, we've got five flights which are flying every day or on that particular day. We've got 700 passengers already flying. So these, these planes are already taking off. They're going somewhere, they're landing somewhere. The cost, the general cost structure that we see, so provided information is Meals and drinks are about $6.50. Cost of fuel is about 90. The cabin crew for attendance per flight is $6-ish. Cost of flight crew is just over 11. Got a question for you on that in a second. Depreciation of aircraft is about 17. Aircraft maintenance is about eight. So we have five flights going every day with 700 people on it. That's what would happen even if this order wasn't taken on. So what of these costs would not change even if we added an extra 150 people? And we'll work up from the bottom. Would the aircraft maintenance likely change if we add a few more people onto the flight? I don't know exactly how aircraft get maintained, but I'd imagine it's on flight hours, not on if there's 700, if there's you know, 140 people versus 170 people on board. So aircraft maintenance probably doesn't. Well, it depends, on Dep depends on the country. Okay. Yep, so. All right, well, I think. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, there's going to be an effect, but I'd imagine maintenance, for the most part, isn't driven a huge, huge amount by those marginal passengers. It could be, I could be wrong with this, but it's probably not. Depreciation of aircraft, you got five aircraft, they're, they're flying anyway, that's probably not, that's gonna happen. The flight crew, well, we've got people flying the plane and they're gonna be flying the plane regardless of whether or not there's 140 or 150 people on board. So, although we do have the technology now at to have planes flown remotely. We have drones, you know, they get from point A to point B quite effectively. So my question to you, this is, an, this is an interesting one. The technology exists to do this. It's pretty much full, I imagine it's pretty much foolproof. Would you feel comfortable being on a plane if you knew the pilot was in an office somewhere flying it remotely? I don't think many of us would be, to be honest. Um, but it would make them way more efficient because, you know, a lot of the piloting job, you know, aside from emergencies, is takeoff and landing. For the rest of that, you know, if it's a 12-hour flight, for most of that time, they're not... And this is not with any disrespect to pilots, but they're not having to do a huge amount of work in the rest of that time. It's kind of the first five or ten minutes, the last five or ten minutes. So imagine they're doing this from an office. Instead of doing one flight for 12 hours, they could be doing, like, a dozen flights how much more efficient would they be? No, that's a different thing. That's, that's an issue, but I don't think that's an efficiency issue. Yeah.
No, but there, I'm, 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 I don't believe, I, I wouldn't fly on a plane without a pilot in it, yeah. but I'm just saying like... But I was just away from that just when... Yeah, yeah. Really oh, look, I'm sure they'd get it. I'm sure they'd get some sort of warning. There'd be sort of people on standby just in the office, just, oh, okay, we've got to deal with it now. I don't know. I assume it's assuming there's no major lag. Anyway, I was, I was hypothetical. Um, so flight crew, you need flight crew. Cabin crew, you need cabin crew. There's an issue about whether you need maybe extra cabin crew, but let's say that doesn't tip over to a point where you need extra cabin crew. Fuel, the marginal cost of fuel is probably immaterial. I mean, if you think about the average, I think the average male is about 80 kilos, say they've got 20 kilos of baggage, so say it's like 100 kilos of extra stuff per person. A plane is pretty heavy. An extra 100 kilos is probably not going to do a huge amount for the extra fuel required. It may have a really tiny effect, but not a lot. So pretty much, whoops. Ah, but you actually need, but who's going to serve? I'm talking about the fuel. Like most time you use yeah, no, but. Yeah, no, so I mean, I, I think the fuel cost would be pretty immaterial. Um, so, I mean, meals and drinks are pretty much it. Like, that's your variable cost. That's the relevant cost for an additional person, assuming the plane is already going. That's it. That's your marginal cost. Well, we're assuming, in this, we're assuming in this analysis so far that the additional person doesn't mean you get to a point where you need an extra crew member. You can get to a point where you might have to tip over and you need an extra person and then that would become a relevant cost. So if you've got to go from four flight crew to five, then that additional flight crew cost would be relevant. It just depends on where you're at with things. But we're assuming in this so far that that additional person or additional people doesn't mean any additional crew is required. It might do, but not so far. So for this, assuming, making those assumptions about what's extra and what's not, it's food, that's it, six bucks fifty. You could charge these guys six bucks, or you could charge them seven dollars and you'd make money. So in terms of 125, Yes, it's less than the full cost, but a lot of those costs aren't relevant. The only thing which is relevant is the $6.50 in this case, which means 125 makes you money. Now, strategically, you've got to figure out whether or not that's something you want to do, but what happens if you're at capacity? So what happens if you've got to kick off full paying passengers, as in you, you wouldn't be kicking them off. They just couldn't be getting on. Like they wouldn't be able to buy a ticket. So you're actually, there's an opportunity cost, the cost foregone of a full, t of a full fare ticket of $275. So on one hand, and I disagree a little bit with how this has been set up because the meal is not a relevant cost. If you've got a full plane you've either taken the special order and some of those people are paying a cheaper rate or you've got a full plane and everyone's paid the full rate, you're going to be providing meals to everyone anyway. So the meal cost is not relevant. What is relevant is you get 125 for a, tick, for a seat or you get 275 for a seat. You still end up with a loss of $150. So you still end up with the same net loss and so it's not worth doing it. So if you're at capacity, you're charging 275. You're going to lose money otherwise. And that's the same reason why if you've got frequent flyer miles, it's really hard on high, on high traffic routes to get a seat purely using miles because there's basically a massive loss of income for them because they're going to have to get rid of a full fare passenger to allow someone with miles on board. They're not, they lose all that revenue. Whereas, bye-bye. <laughs> Whereas where you've got excess capacity, to get a seat on, an excess, on, on a, 
plane which has got excess capacity, it costs them next to nothing. Um, I know there was an exam another situation in there um, which got at Louise's point about the extra flight attendant, but just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you get an extra flight attendant on board because you tip over a certain number of seats, then the cost of that flight attendant becomes a relevant cost. If we change the scenario completely, if it was instead of we've got five flights in that day and we're going to just separate, spread out those 150 people on those five flights, what happens if we just charter a plane? And so it's a plane that wasn't going to be flying anyway and we're going to fly that plane specifically for those people. That changes a whole bunch of things because the fuel costs would then be relevant because you're actually having to fly a plane which wouldn't have flown otherwise. The crew costs, flight and cabin would be relevant because they wouldn't have been working otherwise. Maintenance and depreciation, maintenance probably not, so I don't necessarily agree with that, but the, some things will change. Crew, fuel, food costs, some things wouldn't because the depreciation would happen anyway, other things would be happening anyway, so you kind of let them be. You'd still probably try to charge for them if you could, but it's not a situation where you'd be losing money if you let, let them go. Um, other things to consider? I would say the first one, you, you could actually broaden that out a little bit. Not what if passenger load predictions are wrong, just what happens if your estimates are wrong? Like what happens if your costings are wrong full stop? If your load predictions are wrong, it's going to cause a problem because if you're starting to eat into actual full paying passengers, that's going to cost you a lot more than if you've got capacity. So you, want, you don't want that to be wrong. But what happens if all your other costings are wrong? You, that's going to cause you problems. Um, what is the impact of selling discount seats on regular fare customers? Don't know if that's actually that important. It's important in certain, certain circumstances. I don't think it's important here. Everyone's been on a plane before. You know how much you pay for your ticket. I'd, I'd hazard. Do you know how much the person sitting next to you paid for theirs? So how would anyone even know? Like, I don't think that affects the regular... What is the impact of selling discount seats on regular fare customers? Okay, well, there's two, maybe an element to this, which kind of brings into the, to the bottom one. I don't think regular fare customers are going to be too worried because they just don't know. They'd be sitting on a plane and they would have no idea what the person sitting next to them has paid for it. So that, I don't think, has an effect. Where it could potentially impact them is if you're creating an issue where customers potentially long-term customers are having issues even getting on the plane and booking for certain routes because they're starting to load up with these sort of, these sort of arrangements, that could start to frustrate people because they just can't get flights. But I don't know so much about the second one in this case. So this demonstration we will do. The, there's a few examples of later things we'll do, but we will leave a lot of the lecture demonstrations out. There's a lot of text on here, and I'm going to write some of this down because we're going to go to Excel so I can walk you through it. Because I'm going to walk through it slightly differently than what the answer you've got. I mean, it'll give you the same number to answer, but just slightly differently. So Sydney Glass Company has been offered a contract to supply 500 windshields to a large automobile manufacturer at a price of 41, 4165. Um, its full cost is 51.80. Its normal price is 73.50, and its variable costs are 34.30. In order to meet the needs of the auto manufacturer, it will have to cut sales to regular customers by 100 windscreens annually. The automaker has clearly indicated that it will only take on this agreement if they supply all 500 windshield, wind screens. So to do this, let's take it from the position of we are taking, taking the order. 
And what we're purely interested in is what is different than if we hadn't taken the order. So if we take this order on, if I can spell correctly, we get additional revenue. And that additional revenue is on 500,000 units at 4165. So the additional revenue that we will receive, the relevant revenue, is $20,825,000. That is additional revenue that we will get. Other relevant information is the fact that we will lose revenue because we will lose 100,000 sales at 7350. So we're now, we've gained revenue by taking the order, but we've also lost revenue by taking the order. And we have additional, oops, additional costs. Now, this is where you've got to think through what is the marginal effect which is happening here. If we hadn't taken the order, we would have been selling 100,000 units anyway. By taking the order, we're, selling, we're making and selling 500,000 units. So by taking the order, we only need to make, the only relevant thing which goes on is an extra 400,000 units of production. And the variable cost, because again, we're looking just at the relevant information, the variable cost is 3430. So the additional cost to take this on are 13,720,000. So this is what changes from not taking the order to taking the order. From taking the, to take the order, we're making an extra 400,000 units and the variable cost to make those 400,000 units are 3430 a unit. So it's an extra $13.72 million. To take the order, we lose 100,000 of, of our full paying customers and we get 500,000 of this cheaper customer. When we add them all up, the net effect is $245,000 negative. If we take this order on in its configuration as it is, we will be worse off than if we hadn't have taken it in the short run. Now, Damien's comment about opportunity costs. This revenue here, that revenue that we're losing, that's our opportunity cost. We're losing $7 million of sales to these customers because we're selling to these new customers. That's the opportunity cost which is sitting there. Um, so in the short term, you wouldn't do it. Well, I mean, if you're just purely basing on short-term analysis from here, you wouldn't do it. Um, could there be other factors that you want to consider? Quite possibly, but at this stage it doesn't look like something that you would do. Okay, so moving on from that, the decision to outsource. So, so the second of the decisions that we're going to have a look at Affects a wide range of organizations. Even you, I know we don't make product as such, but outsourcing happens, like accounting firms have been outsourcing left, right and center. Um, universities have been outsourcing things as well. Um, it's even outsourcing various different parts of the uni. When you walk into this building, downstairs, level two, there's a concierge desk, there's security there. They don't work for UTS. They work for a different company. Go back seven, eight years ago, it's going back a while, security were employed by UTS. They, they, they technically worked for us. Then there was a change and the same people were working, but they weren't employed by us anymore. 
Same with the cleaners. For a while, for a long time, they were UTS employees. Then one day, same people were turning up and they were not UTS anymore. So this happens. Um, we're looking at... No, nah, we haven't had, I can't say we've had too many problems. Um, yeah, no, nah, we've been pretty good, but that said, I tend to lock my office. But they've got the keys, so what do you do? Um, no, nah, I, I, I think I've got, I've had no problems with them. I think they're all, the one, for, every, for all the ones that I know, and I know a few of them, they, they're all good. So I've got no problems. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a way, look, as we said, Apple buy components in. They don't manufacture everything, they sort of piece it all together, but they don't manufacture a lot of those components. So, and it makes sense for companies not to do a lot of that. And that's, the reasoning for that is a little bit outside my expertise. Uh, um, a lot of the, a lot of say data input, like if you need, if they need just sort of some, some just like, lo like low level stuff of just things being inputted into, into systems, they'll have, because of now um, with information technology, you can send a lot of that stuff up to countries where the hourly rate is gonna be a lot lower. Now there's, there are concerns about quality, like quality assurance and you know, how you manage that, but they'll send a lot of that stuff overseas to get the, the, the stuff input and then it'll get sent back for, I suppose, analysis and whatnot. But, but it's gonna even change from that because you're getting some really, um, so put it this way, a graduate accountant in Australia would be on about 55-ish, that sort of level. If you go to other countries and you're know, well qualified, I mean, the cost of living is lower, but well qualified to the same degree that you know, a lot of our students would be, but on a yearly rate would be 20% of that cost. And if they're getting the same quality of work, but at 20% of the cost, and maybe a little bit extra to, to manage it, manage the operations overseas, they'll ship a lot of that stuff off overseas. So you'll see more and more of even sort of better skilled work being pushed and outsourced that way. Um, it is causing, it's causing some problems for the local grad market because they're just not picking up as many as they used to. Anyway, that's a completely separate, separate thing. Um, so yeah, there's reasons for it. We're not, one, don't have the time, two, it's not in my particular area of expertise. But let's say they want to potentially look at outsourcing some of what they do. So the, the case we have here is a situation where they're making a product, in this case a golf club, internally, $5 a unit, $9 a unit, $3 a unit, fixed manufacturing of $9.50 a unit. So to make this golf club, it is costing Birdie Maker, for God's sake, um, Birdie Maker $26.50 per club. Now somebody's turned up and said, hey, we will buy this from you. We will sell this. We see that you, you know, your cost of nine, you know, we don't know, they probably don't necessarily know what the cost structure is, but you know, it's 2650, we can sell it to you for 25. So on the face of it, that looks cheaper than what they're making it for internally. The question is, do they go forward with it? And the answer to that is maybe. You zoom. So we have direct, Direct me to. Fair enough. It wasn't like I wasn't watching what was going on there. It was like. Uh, it's the final 20 minutes and it just couldn't last. All right. So if we're making. So this is our cost to make. 2650. If we were to buy, we wouldn't have to pay for anything if we were buying it, but if we're buying it, it would cost us $25. Now, on the face of that, you go, that looks great. 
except you, know, you wouldn't have any direct material costs, you wouldn't have any direct labor costs, your variable overhead costs wouldn't be there because you're not making anything, but your fixed overhead cost still exists. Your fixed overhead cost is still there. Now, this is where I just want to change things up a little bit from what you've got in the slides. Um, you are $8 there. So to buy is actually $8 more expensive than it is to make because the, variable, the fixed cost is still there. The thing that I would change about this is the following. Because what we've included in that analysis has included the fixed cost in, the co in there. Fixed costs are not relevant. Fixed costs are not different between those different courses of action. So I would actually view it as the fixed costs are going to happen anyway. The fixed costs are irrelevant to the situation. So the, the relevant costs in this case to make, there are $17 of relevant costs to make. There are $25 of relevant costs to buy. Still the same outcome, but I would see it as $8 as that marginal effect. And it still means that buying is more expensive. Now, I think if you look through a variant that takes place, where's my, just double check. A variant which takes place is that, it, that we get rid of some of the fixed costs. So if we have this one, and we'll copy it over. So we'll take this back up to $9.50, $9.50. Of this, one of the variants is, well, what happens if we can get rid of a machine which costs us five dollars fifty a unit, so we can actually reduce our our fix our very our fixed costs. So if it was making, we'd have nine dollars fifty in very in fixed overhead. If we were buying, we would only have four dollars in fixed overhead. So again, to me, I mean, the number will still end up the same, but. Five, the $4 is there here and it's there over here. The $4 is not relevant. The $4 will be incurred whichever way you go. So I'd actually take this down to being the $5.50 is relevant because you will incur that if you continue to make the goods, but you won't incur that if you buy the goods in. So we're ignoring the $4 for this analysis. Now, that's not to say the $4 isn't a cost. It is a cost. You are spent, you are paying for that, that 4,000 in total. It, it does happen, but it's not relevant because it happens whichever way you go. Um, there is another variant in there, but I will leave that be for the moment, just again, with the interest of time. Um, but as you see, you can start to sort of look at what changes. And that's the key to all of these things is what changes amongst different courses of action. Uh, the decision to drop a product or service. These are sometimes tough decisions because, you know, products don't just come out of thin air. People are involved in designing products. People are involved in the decision to, to create a product, to, to run it, to, to put it together. So when they hear that their product's going, like it's it's hard. Um, you know, if I was told that this subject was stopping, you know, I'm invested in it. So, you know, I would find that a bit, I would find that frustrating because it's not just a subject. It's, I see it as something more than that. So it is something which is more than just quantitative, but quantitative does tell us something about it. And it is something that we should have a look at. So with this particular company, they've got, they, make modern snow tires. Well, they make tires. They make a whole bunch of different sorts of tires. In total, they make 35,900 in income. And you go, okay, well, that's good. But if you look at just the modern snow option, they're losing money. 
Now, given climate change and all the rest of it, you could say, well, snow tires in Australia probably aren't the best options. But, you know, fingers crossed, though, because I'm going down in a few weeks. But if you look at the mud and snow tire range, if you separated them out from the other tires, what you see is they're losing 500 bucks. And you go, well, you're losing 500 bucks, shut it down. But let's think about what's relevant here. So let's imagine a situation where we drop that line. We will lose sales. You, so if you drop that line as compared to not dropping it, if you drop that line, you will lose 25,500. So that's going to be a negative effect on you. You'll have less money coming in. If you, have, if you drop that product line, you will have less variable costs. So that's a good thing. Direct materials, direct labor, overhead, you don't need these anymore. Those won't happen. 12, 5, 2, that gives you 19. So you'll lose variable costs, but that is an, uh, that's a good thing to have happen. So that will be a positive for us. And one more thing, you don't lose all of the fixed costs. The fixed costs are at 7,000. You save only two. So you're losing fixed costs, but you're not losing all 7,000 of them. You're only losing 2,000 fixed costs. So this is the relevant information. This is what changes if you drop that line, at least in the short term. You lose those sales, less money coming in. You lose those variable costs of 19,000, so you're less money is going out. And you're saving 2,000, so you're losing 2,000 of fixed costs. So that's a positive effect. But when you add those up, you end up with negative four and a half thousand. So you drop this line, and even though the line itself in total is losing money, if you drop this line, you are going to be worse off. And the reason you're going to be worse off, it's got a positive contribution margin. So each sale is actually adding to paying your fixed costs. So it's actually you know, if your variable costs were less than, if your variable costs were greater than your sales price, that's an issue, shut it down. But in that case, on that front, it looks all right. You're not able to get rid of all your fixed costs. Because often some of these other fixed costs might be just headquarter costs that have been allocated to that division or allocated to that product. The headquarter costs will still be there even if the product is gone. So that's something to consider when you're looking at this. Um, so in this case, on a short-term, purely, purely quant basis, don't drop it. Um, nearly there. Nearly there. Two more. A resource utilization decision requires an analysis of how best you use a resource that is in limited, su excuse me, limited supply. We all have limited amounts of time. It's about how we best choose to use that time. Some of those may be conscious choices. Some of them may not be. You choose right now to be here. Obviously, some people have chosen not to be here. Some people chose to be here for a while and then not to be here. You may choose to be here over the next two weeks. You may choose to spend that studying. You may choose to spend that watching Game of Thrones. You may choose to spend that sleeping or doing something else. There's lots of different ways to spend your time. What we're doing here is looking at from a business point of view, what is the most productive way for them to allocate the products that they make? We're looking at fairly short-term decisions because in the longer term, you can change the constraints. But you may have limited amounts of shelf space. You have, may have limited number of machine hours to actually produce things. You may have limited amounts of labor in a certain time frame. So you need to change that. Um, so what we're going to do is to look at a situation where all right, we're going to look at a situation where we have two products, two golf balls. They have 300 hours to produce. That's machine time to produce. Each of these, each of these products, the pro and the tour, have a contribution margin per unit of 150. So on that basis, they look indistinguishable. We sell one of the pro, one of the tour. We're just as well off. 
But what we're interested in is which one should we focus on given we have 300 hours of machine time and it's hours a unit, half an hour, 45 minutes. What we want to do is work out how much contribution margin is generated per hour the machine runs because that's the constraint we're working within. So contribution margin per hour is 300 because each half hour generates one of these which gives us 150. We've got two of them being produced an hour gives us 300. For the tour model, 45 minutes. So we have contribution margin per unit of 300 versus 300 an hour versus 200 an hour. It's not up on, sorry. So the machine time is limited to 300 hours. We can make one carton in 30 minutes. So every, so it's half an hour to make one unit. So in one hour, we'd make two units and each unit has 150 contribution margin. We get 300 an hour. This one we make, we'd make one point something an hour. At, I think it's like 1.3 an hour. $150 a unit gives us $200, $200 each hour. So we should focus exclusively on making the pro. That gives us the biggest contribution margin for the overall amount. And you could actually work out that, what that would be. 300 times by 300 versus 300 times 200, which gives you... So if the market would accept it, we'd make a contribution margin. If we ran this machine solely on pro, we'd make a $90,000 contribution margin overall. Versus if we ran it solely on this one, we'd make a 60,000 contribution margin. So if we can do it, we would make all pro model, and that would mean we'd make 600 cartons, which is 300 hours at half an hour a carton. We'd make 600, and that's all that we'd do. That's assuming the market would take that. The market doesn't take that. The market only will accept 400 cartons of the pro, so then we're kind of a bit stuffed because we can't make 600. So we dial it back down, we make 400. And if we make 400 cartons, so if you can only sell 400 cartons, you dial it back down the pro to 400 cartons, which would take 200 hours. You then have 100 hours of spare capacity. You would take that and you would make tour model with that other 100 hours. That would give you about 133 cartons that you'd make there, which is under the capacity in the market, which is 150, and you'd sell them. So you do 400 and 133. That would be the mix that you would choose, given that constraint. That, so yep. Yeah. So, I mean, the machine constraint is that you can only do 300 hours. So if you've, got a machine, if you've got a constraint on manufacturing, you choose the one which gives you the biggest bang for the machine hour. And you do that up until the point where the market won't actually accept what you're putting out there. And at that point, you go, well, we can't sell anymore. Stop, and I'll produce something else. So that would be the optimal product mix. So maximize contribution margin per hour and then just flog as many of those as you can until the market won't take it anymore and then make the other thing. Um, if you only made one product, you probably got a problem because maybe the company, you know, it leaves yourself at risk if the market changes. It, customers probably want more than one product, so it is probably worthwhile having more than one product, although you probably don't want thousands of them. Um, if you're really having trouble, just get new machines. Get more machines, increase capacity. But obviously, you need to do that with the view of, okay, well, how are things actually going to play out in the future? The very final one, and we're done. Sell or process further.
pretty common. Uh, it can be quite a common decision. Do you value add? Do you make it a little bit better than what you've already done? There will be incremental. There, so this is a story about change. And this is a good chance to reflect on the whole of what this topic was about, is about what is relevant. What has happened, once you produce something, the cost of production is sunk. Like you can't change that. So what is the marginal effect of value adding to it? And I'm going to use, we're going to use furniture as an example here. Unassembled to assembled furniture. I'm going to use a store, which I'm sure you've been into. If you've moved house, if you're setting up a place, I've spent far too long I care. Because they, that stuff is unassembled. And the reason, I mean, there's a lot of reason why that's the case, but I'm pretty sure that it allows them to be a little bit cheaper with what they do because they don't have to spend the time assembling it. In terms of storage, it's probably cheaper for them. But it means that we end up being lumped with trying to figure out what part A and part B are and where things are and why do I have an extra bit left over when everything's being put together. But they're basically pushing, pushing that cost onto you in terms of time. Now, if you want, you can get them assembled and they will actually send people out there to do that. That will be an extra cost to do that. So there's the base cost of producing it and then there's an additional cost to, assemb like to assemble it and to prepare it and whatnot. There will be an additional charge for that. So if it's unassembled, it's 150. If it's assembled and fully done, it's 225. They are purely worried in terms of whether to go from here in terms of unassembled to here assembled is what is the marginal effect. They don't care about the cost of the 150 and the 100. It is purely what is the marginal revenue and what is the marginal cost. So the marginal revenue is $75. So you will get an extra $75 for taking this course of action. That 100 isn't relevant, it's already happened. The 45 is the additional or the marginal cost. So it is worthwhile for them to do this. The market is saying it is worthwhile assembling these things because they, can, they will make money doing that. And that, as I found out in my previous classes, I just felt like there should be something further. But that's it. That is...